Awesome. Thanks, Rick. Uh, well, good morning, church. It, it is so good uh, just to be here. Um, I'm, it's, it's a bit surreal for me right now. Um, just to, for those of you that don't know a little bit of my story, um, uh, I was born in, um, well, I was kind of born and raised in the Catholic Church. Uh, and then when I was 15, uh, I was introduced to Jesus. And uh, my life hasn't been the same. And uh, when I heard about who Jesus is and what he had done for me and this um, invitation to not just an eternal life, but an abundant life that starts today with him, I was all in. And uh, uh, this was in Orange County, and, and then I started going to church, and then my youth pastor encouraged me to go to Pacific Christian College, which is now Hope International University down in Fullerton, California, and I just wanted to study youth ministry. And in uh, December of 1994, I was hired here to be the youth pastor. And uh, I think, Rick, you were part of that team that brought me on, and uh-huh, right. Yeah, I'm going to tell my wife that too. Um, and uh, the church took a risk on this crazy college kid who just, you know, just loved Jesus and wanted to do ministry. And, um, and then uh, in 1997, I met my wife at, in college, and she's from Portland, and she really just wanted to move back up to the Pacific Northwest. So in 97, we moved up to uh, Tigard in the Portland area, and I was the youth pastor there for six years. Then we were sent out, and we planted a church for the next 10 years with the organization that I'm working for right now. And then during that time, uh, I eventually became the executive director of this ministry called Expand Northwest. And so it's just a bit surreal for me just to be here. Uh, I feel a little backwards because... The front of the church was there the last time I was here, so everything's a little bit turned backwards, but I'm just so grateful to be here. Uh, this church not only has poured into me as a young pastor and uh, mentored me and challenged me, but um, also this church has faithfully been uh, supporting financially and partnering with Expand Northwest for the last decade, and I'm just extremely grateful and just consider this just to be, you know, my home church uh, where things started. I was ordained here, um, and so uh, it's just been a special weekend so far. I had an opportunity to meet with some of your leaders yesterday to pray and dream about what God's doing. So I'm excited uh, just to give you a quick overview about who we are and what God is doing. Um, Expand Northwest really exists simply to partner with kingdom workers and our hope and goal is we want to connect as many people to King Jesus and his church as possible. That's what we want to see. We just want to see as many people as possible come to know who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, how Jesus can change your life and completely change your trajectory and where you're going, what you're doing. And we get to do three things in our ministry. We get to come alongside, encourage pastors, and then we get to help train disciples, and then we get to help plant new churches. Um, Matthew 9, 35 through 38, which is actually the, the text that we're going to be in this morning, but it's one of the key verses that our ministry is built around. It says this, that uh, Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages. He was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. And then when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but it's the workers that are few. So therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. And so one of the reasons why we do what we do is because we believe the harvest is plentiful all around us. 33% of the world's population have never had the opportunity to hear the story of Jesus that we're talking about today. A third of the world's population have never heard this story. Uh, in the early 90s, 90% 90 of the United States and America identified as Christians. Nearly 30 years later, 
in 2020, Christians accounted for 64% of the U.S. population. And so we see the shift that's happening in America where it was a Christian nation and now it's starting to decline in what's happening. Um, those that are not affiliated, known as nuns, not as in Catholic nuns, but as in religious unaffiliated N-O-N-E-S. Um, in America, that has grown in 2007 from 16% to 30% in 2020. So we believe that the harvest is plentiful all around us. And one of the things that we get to do is come alongside and just breathe encouragement to our pastors to stay in the fight, to keep doing what God's calling them to do. Uh, more than 4,000 churches closed in America in 2020. Over that same time, over 20,000 pastors left the ministry, and 50% of current pastors today said that they would leave the ministry if they had another way of making a living. So there's this great discouragement that's, that's been going on within pastors. And one of the things that we get to do is we just get to come alongside and love on the pastors and pray for the pastors and bless the pastors and their families. And then we also get to come alongside and help train disciples so that we can be disciples that will make disciples that will make disciples so that more people will come to know Jesus. An interesting statistic that we came across that 9 out of 10 people under the age of 40 right now are not interested in attending a religious service. So when you think about People under the age of 40, 90% of them are not going to walk through the front doors of this church to explore their spiritual curiosity. But 6 out of 10 of people under the age of 40 say that they are willing and eager to engage in a spiritual conversation to explore their spiritual curiosity and their questions. So in our mind, then we thought, how in the world do we help come alongside churches and train disciples where we can encourage and equip every Jesus follower to be confident and courageous to engage in a spiritual conversation around King Jesus? And then finally, we get to plant churches. We get to start new, new churches, like, so like a church like this where people can come together and be encouraged and get to hear the Word of God and, and, and be challenged and, and to love one another. Uh, right now, four out of five churches in America are in decline or plateau. Another way of looking at that, 84%, 84% of our churches are in decline or plateau. 4,000 churches close in America every year with only 1,000 churches opening up. So we're just saying, can we put more Jesus-centered, gospel-focused churches around the world so that more people will come to know Jesus? Just there's, um, I just listed just some of the projects. Uh, we have information back there on that table if you want to look more closely about some of the churches that we have been partnered with. But in 2019, we were able to start a church in Vancouver, Washington, um, and then also um, in Portland area, a city called Wilsonville. Both of those churches have been able to step into leasing uh, warehouse space and they get to use it simply just to bless the community that building is being used on a daily basis to just meet the needs of of the community and they're already committed to planting another church as it is even though they they just started in 2019 in 2021 we planted a couple more churches in portland one of them is called kynos uh, Portland PDX, and this is a different model. Uh, they are actually doing house churches weeks two, three, and four, and then they come together like this on the first Sunday of the month and worship together. And they're finding that a lot of people are willing to come into a living room and have a, a meal and talk about Jesus and be open to that conversation as well. Makers uh, Church is another church that's downtown Portland. They just adopted a coffee shop, and they're using the coffee shop as a storefront as a way to simply just build relationships with people as they come in and then get to continue to tell them about Jesus. In 2022, we got to plant a church in Springfield, Massachusetts. George Barna declared that Springfield, Massachusetts in 2019 was the least biblical-minded city in the nation. And so... Um, uh, we started partnering with them uh, a couple of, uh, just last year. Just two Sundays ago, um, they started their first pre-gathering service and had their first baptism. They've been meeting in a house church for over a year now as well. So we're seeing God just continue to do things with that. In addition to that, God opened up a door for us to partner with 20 
eight pastors in Kachungwa, Uganda. And um, we've just set up a hub where they can encourage pastors and train disciples and plant churches. Just last year, 71 people accepted Jesus and were baptized and three new churches were started. My wife and daughter and I get to go in August and just go visit them and just love on them. But God is moving in a significant way. Tomorrow I'll fly to Dallas. Uh, We're uh, working with a couple who lives in Wisconsin. We're walking them through a church planting assessment because they want to move to Portland so that they can do a church planting residency with us and then start a new work in Portland as well. And so we just see God moving in great ways. And uh, we just wanted to come and just give you a a quick update. Again, all this information is um, back there on that table. So please grab a card. It'll give you a little bit more information about who we are and what we're doing, our latest newsletter. If you would like to be on that mailing list, you're certainly welcome just to drop us a note. But um, just wanted to come and say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your financial support. And I wanted to encourage you because of your partnership with us, the kingdom of God is literally being expanded from Portland to New England to Uganda. Pastors are being encouraged. Disciples are being trained. Churches are starting to rise up with the idea of we want to help start new churches. So thank you for your kingdom partnership. And I hope that you're encouraged with what God is doing with this church to be able to to partner together with that. So um, Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. So the strategy then is ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into the harvest field. So when Rick asked me to come and speak, he said, hey, we're going through the gospel of Matthew. We just happen to be um, in Matthew 9, verses 32 through 38. Would you be okay speaking on that? I'm like, Yes, I would. Yes, I would. And so I was very excited about that. And so I am just um, so eager um, just to dive into our time together with this this morning. So let's pray together, and I'll invite you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll actually start in chapter 4. So Father God, we just stop and praise you. Father, we say, hallowed be thy name. God, we give you thanks. We give you praise for the work that you're doing. God, I thank you for this faithful church here in Northridge. I thank you, God, for the history of the years of exalting Jesus and expanding your kingdom. And I just thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning. And God, we thank you for the kingdom work that we get to be part of. And Father, we just... Ask right now for your kingdom to come here in Northridge as it would be in heaven. And God, would you just give today our, our daily bread, whatever it is that, that we're coming in with this, with this morning. We're, we just want to come to you. Jesus, you promise us, anyone that comes to you, if we're tired and weary, that you'll give us rest. And so we just want to come and just be with you. And Jesus, ask that you would meet our needs. And would you continue just to Forgive us of the things that we have done and help us to forgive those that have wronged us. And would you lead us away from temptation, away from living the life that you have called us to live. And would you deliver us from evil. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our time together. And would you teach us? Would you open up our ears? Would you open up our hearts? Would you give us compassion for those that are like sheep without a shepherd? We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the big idea that I'd like to just continue just to talk with you this morning about is um, this idea that the kingdom of God is near. Isn't that great? Have you thought about that? The kingdom of heaven is near. It's here, but not yet. But the kingdom of God is near and All of us are being invited into a personal relationship with King Jesus and we get to participate in His kingdom work for God's greatness. Now let's just stop there for a second. Let's think about that statement. That the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, it's near. 
every day it's around us and every single man woman child there's this invitation to come into a personal relationship with king jesus the lord the master of our life and you and i get to participate in the kingdom work that he has prepared for us to do all so that we can just say this is for god's glory and god's greatness And the reason why we want to start with this idea is that we want to understand that everyone gets to participate in the kingdom of God. There is no elite people. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor. It doesn't matter if you're an elder or a ministry team leader. It doesn't matter if you're a dentist or a construction worker or whatever it is that you do. If you follow King Jesus, you are in a relationship with him and you get to participate in the kingdom of God work amen and it's an exciting thing and i just love the gospel of matthew i hope that you've been enjoying your time through the gospel of matthew it's one of my favorite books and uh you probably already know but this is just a reminder matthew was a tax collector right and matthew became a disciple of jesus jesus came alongside matthew and said why don't you come and follow me and then he got up and followed Jesus and then he writes this letter and he's writing to the Jews specifically and he's trying to convince the Jews through the birth and the life and the miracles and the interactions and the teachings and the death and the burial and the resurrection and the mission and the ascension of Jesus so that he can convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised one that all the Old Testament has talked about. It's why Matthew continues to refer over and over again to the Old Testament. Proving to the Jews, Jesus is the Messiah. And at the same time, Matthew is reminding his readers, therefore you and I get to be reminded of this concept, that the the kingdom of God is being ushered in right now. It's not just something that's going to happen when we die and we get to go to heaven, but it's the kingdom of God that's invading the city of Northridge, San Fernando Valley, L.A. County. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of Jesus, it's coming. It's here every day, and you and I get to live that out. And all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, he's just weaving that in so that you and I would be encouraged with this so the kingdom of god just real quick what are we talking about with that a simple definition that i've just tried to live my life by is simply that i believe that the kingdom of god is the rule and reign of king jesus jesus is king he's lord he's master therefore we're servants and everything is coming underneath the rule and the reign of King Jesus. And all of God's people, we are simply focusing on being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and then going about and doing the stuff that Jesus did. That's the kingdom of God. And it wouldn't be for our glory, it wouldn't be for our attention, but it would be for God's greatness. Matthew's announcement, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 if you have your Bibles, we'll just kind of do a quick flyby as we get to our passage this morning. But Matthew just uh, announces in uh, his letter, uh, verse 17, chapter 4, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, and this is what Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's his message to us. That's his reminder to us. And I love... Um, what happens here in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, is actually a bookend with Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, and there's all this kingdom stuff in between, right? Have you noticed that as you've been going through the Gospel? Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. One bookend says this, Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, Proclaiming the good news of what? The kingdom. And healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria 
And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed. He healed them. And then as a result, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the, the region across the Jordan began to follow Jesus. Matthew is declaring to us all this kingdom stuff about what's going on with Jesus. And for the next four or five chapters, he's just going to lay out all that kingdom stuff. And I, I just want to bring our attention back to this before we dive into this understanding that Jesus was literally going out. He wasn't expecting people to come to him. He was going out and he was doing all of these incredible things. And as a result, Matthew tells us large crowds were coming from everywhere to hear about Jesus. Now think about this for a moment. If this was the situation here today, we're in Northridge. Can you imagine people coming up from San Diego? Making the drive up and being like, I've got to hear about this Jesus. Can, can you imagine people coming down from San Francisco, making the drive down like, I've got to hear about this Jesus. Can you imagine people coming over from Vegas, driving over here to Northridge, San Fernando Valley, because of what they're hearing about Jesus. This is what Matthew is saying, that there's such great things that are going on that it's just attracting people from all over the place. The kingdom of God is at hand. Well, that's one bookend. Look at the other bookend in Matthew 9, which we've read a couple times now. But just looking at the second bookend, Matthew records for us, Jesus went throughout all of the towns and villages, and then he was teaching in their synagogues. He was proclaiming the good news of what? Thank you, of the kingdom. One person's with me this morning. Thank you for being here. He was proclaiming the news of the kingdom and he was healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, listen, the harvest is plentiful. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. Come back next week. And guess what happens in chapter 10? Jesus sends out the disciples to go do what he has been doing as well. Matthew is setting up these bookends and just teaching us this all about this kingdom life, right? So if you were just to do a flyby and you think about the kingdom life and what that kingdom stuff is of being with Jesus and becoming like Jesus, chapter 5, the Beatitudes, it's all about just becoming like Jesus, having the same mindset, having that same attitude. In verse 13 through um, 16, he talks about that we're, we're supposed to be living our lives in such a way that we're like salt, that we're like light, that the world is noticing something different. You look at the, the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer in chapter 6, and you remember how Jesus teaches his people how to pray? What does he say? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And what's his prayer? Your kingdom come here on earth as it would be on, in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Help us to forgive others. Lead us not in temptation and deliver us from evil. So Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray for the Lord's Prayer. In, in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus is talking about having your treasures in heaven and not worrying about money, smack dab in the middle of talking about money, what does Jesus say in Matthew 6, 33? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Don't worry about all this money stuff. Let's stay focused on the kingdom of God. And then finally, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses this parable, this story, and says, listen, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, you're like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, it beat, it beat against the house. Yeah, it didn't fall because its foundation was on the rock. What is the foundation? The foundation is a believer that hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice. But then everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice, 
They're like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, it beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus is teaching the disciples how to be with him and how to become like him. And he's saying, listen, this is what the kingdom of God is like when we hear God's voice and we actually do it. And we put it into practice. We have to move away that the kingdom of God is just head knowledge and get to the point of saying, okay, how do we live this out? And then, as you've already been studying Matthew 8 and 9, just the different examples of Jesus doing kingdom stuff. Have you ever noticed this? Chapter 8 and 9, Matthew lays out 12 different examples of Jesus ushering in the kingdom of God. Something about that 12 number, isn't there? That makes a Jew go, that's an important number. I mean, just look at it. Jesus goes and heals a man with leprosy. What do we know about someone with leprosy, church? Unclean, outcast, don't touch him. What's Jesus do? Touches the man. Cleanses them from his leprosy. Why? It's the kingdom of God that's coming. Jesus is ushering in the kingdom of God. Then we see that there's um, this interaction with the faith of a Roman centurion. Church, what do we know about the Romans? How did, how did everyone feel about the Romans at the time? They were not well liked whatsoever. Yet Jesus heals the centurion servant of a Roman, of someone that's potentially an enemy. Why does he do that? The kingdom of God is ushering in. And then Jesus goes and heals Peter's mother-in-law. You're thinking, well, what's that? Why is that a big deal? What was the society towards women in this culture? Second class. Yet Jesus takes the time to go into Peter's house and heals Peter's mother-in-law. The kingdom of God is being ushered in. And then there's a couple examples of demon-possessed people, right? And so uh, Jesus begins to heal the demon-possessed people and, and shows that he has authority over the satanic rule and reign. Why does Matthew record that for us? The kingdom of God is being ushered in. And then Matthew records that Jesus went over to the other side of the lake. What's the big deal about that? For the first time, the gospel is leaving uh, Jerusalem and it's going into a Gentile nation. Why would Jesus do that? The kingdom of God is being expanded and spread out and he interacts with two demon-possessed men and then as a result, what happens? They're sitting there in their right mind. Why is Matthew recording that for us? The kingdom of God is just being ushered in. Then Jesus, uh, in chapter 9, he, he has this interaction where people bring to um, him a paralyzed person, and then as they bring them him, he looks at him, and what's he say to him? Yeah, your sins are forgiven. What? What's going on here? Because if you were paralyzed, guess what people thought about during that time? Ah, either you sinned or someone else sinned in your family. Jesus gets straight to the point and says, listen, your sins are forgiven. And I tell you, get up and walk. So Jesus is ushering in the kingdom of God, not just physically now, but also spiritually and dealing with sin issue. And then we see that Jesus calls who to follow him? Who does Jesus call to follow him? Matthew? Matthew? Are you serious? Out of all the people, Jesus, that you're going to choose to follow you and write a letter, it's Matthew. What do we know about Matthew, church? He's a tax collector. How does the church feel or how does people feel about the tax collectors? Traitors. Don't want to have anything to do with you. Yet Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. Why? Because the kingdom of God is for everyone. It's for those that are far off. And then all of a sudden, Matthew's throwing a huge party at his house. Who's there? Tax collectors. And Matthew records someone else. Oh, all these sinners. 
Jesus, why are you hanging out at a party with tax collectors and sinners? Who do you think you are? She's like, listen, it's not those that are healthy that need the doctor. It's the sick. Jesus is ushering in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus is then going in another example of uh, where he is traveling to go raise the dead girl. Remember, her dad comes to him and says, my, my, my little girl is dying. So Jesus gets up, starts to head over to heal this little girl. And what happens in the middle of it? A woman who's been bleeding for 12 years just touches Jesus. And all of a sudden, she's healed. And isn't it interesting? What do we know about women that were bleeding during that time? unclean, not welcome. And Matthew records specifically that Jesus looks at her and calls her daughter. Why does he use that language? He's ushering in the kingdom of God. And then he goes and then uh, heals this, this girl later on as well. And then later on, finally, we look at the conclusion before the book end where he heals some blind people and he heal, heals some mute people. Church, I just wanted to remind you, if you haven't already seen it, Matthew is telling us that Jesus came preaching Repent, the kingdom is at hand, and Jesus modeled this. And now we get to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. It's the second bookend of all of this point that Matthew is making to us. The kingdom of God is at hand. And church, it's not just for Jesus to do that, and it's not just for his disciples. It's for you, it's for me to participate that as well. So when we look at this particular passage, just a couple thoughts and questions for us. Verse 35, Jesus went throughout all of the towns and villages. What was Jesus doing? Waiting for people to come to him? No, Jesus went out amongst the people in the villages as well as in the synagogues. He was in the marketplace and he was also out in the religious institutions. And Jesus was going out. If you look through the scriptures, God is ascending God. God was the one that first started coming after man and woman after they had sinned, chasing after them. Jesus was sent into the world, and then Jesus went out, and then Jesus calls his disciples to be sent out as well. So here's the question, church, that I'm wrestling with right now. When we look at this passage specifically, are you, are you and I willing to be intentional and to go out like Jesus did? Or are you expecting people to come to you? You see, as Jesus followers, as King Jesus followers, you and I are called to go out and to be amongst people. It's not just for missionaries. It's not just for pastors. It's for Jesus followers. Are we willing to be intentional and go out and be with people like Jesus did? Then we see that Jesus was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and he was healing every disease and sickness. Did you notice that Jesus was, was both proclaiming with his mouth the words that the kingdom of God is at hand, but also at the same time demonstrating with actions and ministering to the needs of people and healing disease and sickness? it was almost like it was the first show and tell. Sometimes Jesus interacted with people and it was all about the demonstration and meeting the needs. Sometimes Jesus was all about just proclaiming the good news. But when we think about living our lives as Jesus followers that are willing to go out, we have to adopt this rhythm that we're going to go out with both sharing the good news and showing the good news. We have found that when we come alongside people and we serve people, no strings attached, here's what happens. Walls begin to fall down and bridges begin to be built. Are we living a life of both serving 
and sharing Jesus. What this has looked like uh, for us is when we're out and about with people, I'm just asking the Holy Spirit, am I supposed to serve here somewhere? Is there, is there some way that you're inviting me to serve? Or am I supposed to speak up and say something here? And sometimes there's a third option where Holy Spirit just tell me to shut up and listen. But that's the tools that we're looking to go out amongst the lost in, in proclaiming the kingdom of God, both show and tell. How can we both serve? How can we share as well? And then we see that Jesus saw the crowds and what emotion was he experiencing? What emotion does Matthew tell us that Jesus had? Compassion. This idea and concept of the deepest, most heartfelt emotion in your body. Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them. His heart broke for people because they were harassed and they were helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Church, do you have a heart of compassion for people that are not like you? for people that don't vote like you, for people that don't believe what you believe, for people who are just doing different crazy things, whatever it may be, do we have a heart of compassion for those that are without the love of King Jesus? You see, I find myself that I tend to be more of judgmental heart and looking at people going, oh, you should just get your act together, get your life together, rather than just having a heart of compassion and just letting our hearts break for people who are far without Jesus. You don't want to know the things that I was doing before I was 15. If you have a daughter, you would not want me dating your daughter before I was 15. Yet people looked at me with compassion, no judgment, no strings attached. They invited me in, and they let Jesus change my life. If we're going to be sent out amongst the kingdom to do kingdom work, church, we have to go with the, with the eyes and the heart of Jesus. Compassion for those that are lost. And then Jesus says, hey, listen, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Isn't that interesting? Nothing's changed. <laughs> is the harvest plentiful today? Absolutely. Would you agree that the workers are few? Yeah. Why? Because most Christians think it's a pastor's job to do that or it's an elder's job to do that. It's not my responsibility. I'm just going to keep believing in Jesus and just kind of going and living my life. When Jesus is reminding us, all of us are called to live a life in such a way that we are ushering in the kingdom of God. I told you the religious nun statistics that were happening across our nation, right, from what was it, 16 17% to almost 30% now. Do you have any idea what the religious unaffiliated statistic is here in L.A. County? It's 46.9%, right where you're at. So if we just do some numbers, you take 46.9% of the population of Los Angeles, so you're talking about... 1,805,000 people that consider themselves religiously unaffiliated. If you drop that down, let's just take San Fernando Valley. You take 46.9%, you're talking about 873,278 people who consider themselves religiously unaffiliated. Let's drop that down even a little bit tighter into the Northridge city the current population may be 70,000 is what I saw 70,653 according to Google that means that there are 33,136 people that consider themselves religiously unaffiliated today and then if we take the statistic and the median age in the city of Northridge is 36 years of age if we take that statistic that Nine out of ten are not willing to walk through the front doors, but six out of ten are open to having a spiritual conversation. Church, you're talking about that 19,881 people are potentially open to having a spiritual conversation and experiencing the kingdom of God being 
ushered into their lives. The harvest is plentiful. It's the workers that are few. Are we living our lives as Jesus' harvest workers? Or are we just dishing that off to the professionals? Because church, you're surrounded by people that are spiritually curious and hungry and that are longing for some type of just spiritual experience. We've got the answer. It's Jesus. And then lastly, Jesus says that this is the strategy. This is where it starts. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't say learn how to preach well. Make sure you run a really good program or a Sunday service. What did he tell his disciples the strategy was? Pray. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to raise up harvest workers. So we have a card back there, Matthew 9.38. We've invited people just to join us in prayer Set your alarm 9.38 in the morning, 9.38 at night, and just ask God to start raising up harvest workers. But I just, as we look at this passage and as this concludes, and again, next week, chapter 10, Rick will take this and Jesus sends his workers out. They've been with him. They've seen him do it. And Jesus like, okay, the harvest is plentiful. Workers are few. Now go. (laughs) It's your turn. And let's talk about it. The kingdom of God, church, is near. It's amongst us. We are all being invited into a relationship with Jesus and to participate in God's kingdom work for his greatness so that more people will get to hear the great story that you and I have already come to know and believe. So what do we do with this? A couple thoughts, some response and reminder for us as we wrap up our time together. For a family response, um, I would suggest that we take Jesus' command and his words and put it into action and we commit ourselves to prayer. It's always a good place to start, isn't it? Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest, so let's do this. And so my encouragement to you, my challenge to you is just to take whatever prayer life that you have and just turn it up a notch and just start becoming intentional and focused and asking God to start with you. And guess what, church? If you begin to ask God to use you as a kingdom harvest worker and give you opportunities, guess what? It's going to happen. He's going to give you those opportunities wherever we go. So three different suggestions for you, um, a rhythm that I've been trying to practice in my daily life. Number one is a morning prayer, and I just simply pray through the Lord's Prayer. Found in Matthew 6. And just just walk through it. This morning I was laying in my bed and I was just praying through the Lord's Prayer. Just asking God, okay, this is what we're doing today. And just to kind of get my heart right with the Lord and start praying through the Lord's Prayer. Sometime in the afternoon, whenever it is that works for you, pray the harvest prayer. Pray, God, would you use me as a harvest worker and then would you raise up other leaders to go send them out as well. And then at night, I love this, Pray the gratitude prayer. Put your head on the pillow. Just think back to all the things that you saw God do that day and just give him praise and glory for that. And so I would invite you just to commit yourself to prayer and get ready to respond because when we pray, God is going to move and give us opportunities to do that. The second thought that I had was more of a personal response as I was going through this and I was looking at the life of Jesus I was just thinking about the compassion that Jesus had. And so I don't know where you are this morning, if any one of these might hit you in this area, but I just wanted to remind you that today the compassion of Jesus is able to be received. Maybe you're here today and you just need to experience the compassion of Jesus, of whatever's going on in your life. And I want to let you know that that, that that is available for us today, right? So uh, I was telling Rick um, this morning that um, February of 2022, I lost my father, um, and it was a really hard season for me, and I just had to learn to let Jesus just love on me and experience his compassion every morning. It took me like three months. This was my only prayer. Jesus, would you just come and love me right now? My heart hurts. 
And so I just want to let you know that Jesus is here today and the invitation is for you just to be able to experience that compassion. Maybe you're not there, but maybe you need to look at yourself in the mirror and examine your heart like I did this last week going through this passage and examine your heart for the compassion of Jesus. Do you have a hard and judgmental heart? Or do you have a soft and compassionate heart? And this is just a simple invitation of Jesus. Would you come in and just change my heart? Would you give me eyes to see people the way that you do? Would you give me a heart that loves people the way that you do? Would you help me to look at those people and realize that's someone's daughter, that's someone's son, that's someone's dad, that's someone's mom, that's someone's brother or sister or aunt or uncle. That person is a child of God that has been made in the image of God. And out of all the people that should be showing compassion on the world, it should be us, yet Christians are known to be judgmental and hateful. Do you just need to allow Jesus to come in and, hey, heart surgery today change my heart for that and then lastly um, maybe you just need to receive boldness and there's a fear of the thought of going out and doing this kingdom work and it's just like that sounds really hard that sounds really scary and you just need to have the power of the holy spirit come in and just fill you again there's a reason why God's word says over 365 times, do not be afraid, because we need to be reminded of it every day. And so the prayer would be, okay, God, just fill me right now so that I can extend this compassion. And then let me end with this. I just threw this in at the very end, but I just want to show you again another bookend that Matthew gives to us. In the beginning of the book, I know it's not Christmas, but you remember in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, Matthew records this interaction that she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what, church? That God is with us. You go to Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter, the last verse, and you look at the other book end, and you may be familiar with this, but Jesus, after he died, was buried, rose again, and then before he ascended, he came to his disciples and said, listen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, church, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you see what Matthew's doing right now? Jesus came so that people can be forgiven of their sins in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said that he is with us. The kingdom of God is being modeled. And now chapter 28, Jesus is sending out his disciples to go out and to extend the kingdom of God and reminding them, guess what? I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. So this morning, uh, just as we close, I would just like to just move us into... Um, a time of prayer um, and just give you an, eye, an opportunity just to receive um, ministry from Holy Spirit in this. And so I'm just going to ask, um, I'm not going to ask you to come forward or even say anything by, right now, but let's just go back and visit these three as we go into a time of prayer. Is there anyone uh, in the room this morning that is resonating with that you, you're just here today and you need to experience the compassion of Jesus today? Would you just raise your hand if that's you? You just need to experience the compassion of Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? Just in a spot right now where you just need Jesus to come in and love on you. 
Secondly, is there anyone here today that just needs for Holy Spirit to come and examine your heart and, and, and just change from a hard, judgmental heart to a soft, compassionate heart? If that's you, would you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Okay. And then lastly, is there anyone here that just, you understand this, you want to do this, but it just freaks you out and you just need to be filled with the power to overcome the fear of living your life as you expand the kingdom of God and just need to be reminded of that? Is that anyone here today? Okay. Awesome. So we're going to close with a song of Christ be magnified in our life. And just let's just go to a time of prayer. <sighs> yeah, come Holy Spirit, come. Come and minister to each and every one of us. Father, we thank you for the example that you set for us with King Jesus. And this morning, uh, we just want to pray for our brothers and sisters. Jesus, just, that just needs to experience your compassion right now. The same way that you went out and healed diseases and sicknesses and just loved on people, uh, Jesus, there are people here this morning that need to experience that compassion. And so right now, uh, we just pray that you would just come wrap your arms around our brothers and sisters that raise their hands for this period of time. Would you love them exactly where they need to be loved and how they need to be loved today? And Father, for those of us that raised our hands, that we just need a heart change. We just want to see people the way that you see people. We want to love people the way that you love people. God, we can't do that on our own power and strength. We need you to change our hearts on a daily basis. So for my brothers and sisters that raise their hand, would you just continue to give them opportunities to change their heart? Would you soften their hearts? Do you give them eyes to see, ears to hear, to see and to hear and to love people through your, your ways, Jesus? Would you break our hearts for those that are lost, and helpless, harassed? And Father, we also recognize that you, you call all of us to go to be sent, Jesus, to do what you did, to do what the disciples did, and now you're calling us to go. But Father, we're scared. There's a fear, an anxiety, and you tell us not to fear, not to be afraid. And so we just want to submit that to you. Would you replace that fear with confidence, that anxiety with peace? And Jesus, every time that we are experiencing that fear, would you be quick to remind us that you're with us always to the very end of the age?
yeah, Jesus, we just want you to be magnified in our lives as king and everything that we say and do. We want to see your kingdom come here on earth as it would be in heaven. Would you continue to lead us just to be the people that you want us to be and to do the things that you're calling us to do? May we hear your words and be obedient and put them into practice. We ask this in the name of King Jesus. Amen.